Hi, I'm Dr. Caitlin Vaughn, and I am here with Ken Dolan Del Vecchio and Nancy, Nancy Saxton Lopez. Sorry, name's a little bit of a tongue twister. Um, and I, they are the authors of the Pet Loss Companion and host a podcast and video cast. And I am super excited to talk to them um, about grief support from a veterinary perspective. Um, I think a lot of stress for veterinarians and vet staff stems from not knowing what to do and not knowing how to support our clients. And so I think your experience in the client sphere is going to be really insightful um, to some of the questions that, I, that I've got for you today. Great. Um, so, so to get started, you know, I think, um, again, a lot of stress stems from being worried we're going to say the wrong thing um, and essentially not knowing what the right thing to say is. Um, can you provide any insight into things that we can do from a veterinary perspective that would absolutely be unhelpful <laughs> um, and try to help transition that into something that might be more supportive? Well, I think, I think a lot of times what happens with pet parents or pet guardians is of course they're very afraid. It's allow, allow, we're going and from a general practitioner to a specialty practitioner to an ER practitioner, right? So there's there's in in general practice, you know, obviously there could be issues with animals that are oh there's something happening now, maybe there's a diagnosis, you know. But I do know that people that love their general practitioner usually have such a good relationship with them or hopefully have a good relationship with them that that the talk is sitting down with them and saying, hey, you know, these are the, these are the results of the tests and this is going to be really hard. And but this is what's going on. Um, and I don't know if that hap it may not happen across the board. Um, the specialty ER people, especially in ERs, is, it's much different because you're in crisis. And so when people come in, they're desperate, they're, they're hysterical, they're upset. And so they they're want to have immediate response, obviously, right? Because it's their animal. And unfortunately, the, you, they may not be able to see them right away in an ER. You know this. I mean, it's a triage, right? So the sicker animals come in first. And so, I mean, it's not necessarily the veterinarian's position. It would be the front desk to say, listen, or the vet tech to come out and say, listen, we know that this is, you know, you, this is really, you know, um, uh, scary for you, frightening for you. Um, we're going to do the best we can. But because they don't have the time either, right? Now, in the context of seeing the animal and then finding out that there's something really wrong or that there's there's a, a uh, there's a terminality or what the, what you guys are saying is hey maybe maybe this animal does need to be euthanized then it's sitting down with them and that's going to be hard because they're so emotional to say you know it's really telling them the truth and that's hard because veterinarians want to save like human doctors do. But what you what it would be important is to, it's hard to say what's bad because there are different ways to categorize that. And it depends on the person, how they take it. But sit down and, and say, look, this is what's happening. This is the prognosis. But it's being with them, right? So you're sitting down, you're not standing over, but you're sitting down and you said, let me talk to you about what's going on with your animal. And then, Ken, you want to one, be more? One of, yeah, one of the things that when when I think about this question, the the thing that really stands out for me that people have been very distressed by is when they feel rushed. Yeah. When they feel like they are pressured to make a decision right then and there. And, and I think that all of what Nancy's saying is key, that there's, the veterinarian needs to be able to hold time with the person and allow them, even if you can't, because I know there's so much pressure, especially if in, the stay in the room to say, as Nancy's saying, to give them all the facts, which they're probably not going to hear very clearly. Right. When we're really anxious. We don't hold on to information, but give them all the facts, ask them if they have questions, tell them the options 
in a very in a very specific way this is what we could try this is probably what that might cost mm -hmm. and what our likelihood of healing or getting better is or you have the option to end their suffering now through euthanasia but definitely give them time yeah. to sit with it that's the one complaint that i've heard yeah more than anything else that even comes to mind is they people feel like they came in sometimes they weren't even expecting a dire diagnosis right. you know their pet maybe has a history of vomiting or has a history of periods of lethargy and they bring them into the the vet and the vet tells them that they have some extraordinary uh, ailment process underway terminal and illness. They're, they're, yeah they're, they're terminally ill that that maybe they've just had a major tumor that broke and they're in great pain and they are just not ready for that. And the, the veterinarian tells them your best option is really to euthanize them because they're suffering and, and they're not given, they feel like they're kind of pressured into it. Yeah. And that, yeah, I, I, I think Ken's right. And it, even if it's a few minutes, because let's say, look, this is a lot for you to process. This is really difficult. And I, we know you love your animal. I'm going to go and we'll check back with you. You know, if the vet tech can help with that too, like to also, you know, come in too and say, wow, this is, this is really bad news. It's really hard. You know, it's being with them yeah. and the problem. And I understand this from a ver veterinary perspective is they're busy. Mm -hmm. You know, if you don't have whole lots of time. And so that's why a team effort is so good because you want to circle back with them and say, what are you thinking? How are you doing? You know, and that's maybe not even possible depending on who's there that night, how many, how many dogs or cats are in there or horses or whatever animal is kind of happening. And so, and, but if the more that they believe that they got some time like Ken said, to kind of process this a little, even though it's going to be almost impossible to do. But, 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 but they have some time, you know. And then one, one other key point that, that stays with me, and this is something that I've heard many other people do, and I almost always do it. If I bring my little dog in and they're in crisis and I'm, the vet is starting to give me this, this option you know, we could put them in an oxygen tank. It's going to cost you $4,000. It probably won't actually solve the issue. What I always ask is if this was your animal, what would you, what do? Would you do? And I like when the veterinarian gives me two things. They acknowledge, they acknowledge that I, this is something my veterinarian said to me. She said, look, it's, I can't tell you what to do. I know you love her, mm -hmm. but clinically mm -hmm. there's no path back here yeah. and clinically if it were my animal mm -hmm. i would make the decision to euthanize them and i think that both of those are important both the acknowledgement of the great love that you have for your animal and then the fact the clinical reality of what you would do i think that that's very helpful because it helps a person to feel like they had an expert who was caring but also gave it to them straight. <laughs> and, and, and gave options. Like the other yeah. side is if the animal doesn't have to be euthanized that moment, yeah. do, would you like to take them home for a night? Would you like yeah. to, it's okay that you have a weekend to give them their, their puppuccinos and their steaks and, you know, their, their trips to the beach, you know? Um, it, but if this is what's going to happen, you know? So, I think that if, if it's not cr crucial at that moment, like a car accident, mm -hmm. and, you know, it, it's, it's not, it's dire. I think that's helpful too, because I think like Ken and I have talked with people, a lot of people around us and they wish sometimes that they, if it could have a little more time and we don't know that, right. Cause it depends on how, how, what was happening that they would like to have a few days, you know, or a day. Yeah. I think what I'm, what I'm, kind of hearing from both of you is that authenticity and honesty are the two biggest things, right? And so I, what I what I sort of am thinking of are those situations where, and we are 
I don't know if this is still true, but I was taught in school not to answer the what would you do question. Um, and I think that may still be part of what, especially yeah. for for our, our early career veterinarians, because they don't, they can't predict the clinical course no. because they haven't seen it. But I think, Ken, what you're saying is is fantastic because it's you don't have to be able to predict the clinical course of disease. You can say, you know, based on what I know, based on my breadth of knowledge and what I've seen, this is what I expect to happen. And I think what what I've learned through my career is that um, the more relatable I am yeah. to the situation, yeah. the better the entire conversation goes. And you know what, the more, Yeah. I, I want to. I want to say that there's a lot of things I was taught as a therapist that turn out to be bullshit. <laughs> example, Throw it out the window. With, so, for example, yeah. I was taught that you should never accept a gift from a client. One of the most offensive things I learned very early on is when you don't accept a small gift from. And a they client. get very upset. It's very. It, it makes them feel like you are dismissing them. We were this taught that you shouldn't analogy. share mm -hmm. your own stories, your own feelings. And I do it all the time all now the time. because yeah. it's just a way to connect with people as human beings. So I I don't think that you are the the, the doctor when when she says, well, I if it were me, I would euthanize your pet. You're not saying you should euthanize your pet. Right. You're saying if it were me, <laughs> that's yeah. the decision. And then what what the client can do is feel very comfortable borrowing your expert opinion mm -hmm. in that. But if you if you won't tell them, they're left alone, struggling That's, with it. Right. That's, there, you, there needs to be there needs yeah. to be the options or the or the yeah. the, the continuum, right? Yeah, and I think I think that's the other piece that I'm getting from from you guys too. Is it's not necessarily a right or wrong thing to right. say. It's how you do it, right? It's how you present the options. It's how you you don't say like you could do A, B, or C. You say you know this is what I this is what I expect to happen. While we could do this, the prognosis is grave, right? And you have that yes. conversation in a way where you can actually sit with somebody. And I mean, I, I was an ER doctor, so I get the rushing, right? Mm -hmm. I think the other reason we rush is that we don't want to sit in there with them. Well, true. It that feels bad. True. Yeah. And that's something that it's important cl for clinicians to work on, to be able to yeah. be present with other people in their discomfort. Right. Even if- What happened? Oh, go ahead. It rouses your own discomfort. Even if right. you have a tear in your eye, even if you have to recompose Fine. yourself, because that allows the other person to recognize that that's appropriate in right. this situation. But yeah, one of the it, it, one of the things I, I was going to say is you can say almost anything to another human being. It's all in how you do it. How you do it. Yeah. It's, and you want to be there and sitting and looking. That's hard for yeah. some veterinarians and vet techs to do. But if you are there and present with them, and you and you give them the feeling this is devastating. This is so upsetting. This is really sad. But these are this is what is happening with your animal. And this these are the things that we can look at. The the one veterinarian I loved, loved, and he moved. <laughs> he moved unfortunately from New Jersey to North Carolina. But what he would he get on the chair or the floor with you. Yeah. You know, and he would say, "All right, this is what I'm thinking." Mm -hmm. And I and you know your dog better. Mm -hmm. I want to know what you think about this or what you think about this. And this is why I'm and it was just amazing because you knew that he was right there with you. Mm -hmm. You know, and I could trust that. Um, mm -hmm. And boy, Ken and I have seen a lot of veterinarians in our time, right? Yeah. With all of our animals. But I, mm -hmm. it's it's being with a person. And that's hard for some people. Um it's it's really hard. And I think too, like, I, I want to kind of like transition this into another question, which is how do we learn to do that as people that, right? And so, so how do we learn to do that? And a lot of times in these situations, there's a little bit of a, either what I'm going to call a value mismatch or a conflict over oh, yeah. what you think is the right decision. So how do we learn to, A, just sit with people um, and, and be in that discomfort and also do that when maybe it's really hard for us to access that compassion. 
Well, and that's true. And I've, I had experiences at Blue Pearl, right, where people came in and their animal needed to be euthanized. And unfortunately, the veterinarian and vet tech were some of those people that really had a hard time. And they came in and really the next day, and I was with them for a while, and they wanted to have a formal complaint. And so, and it, but I understand that your personality is your personality. Maybe you have someone come in with you, a veterinary tech or somebody that you could work with. I mean, a veterinary social worker is the best answer, but, but, you know, but no, you're yeah. working on it. But, um, but so that it, it's just a, a humanity and it's very hard. You can have you know, some people don't have a lot of empathy. They have sympathy. They don't have a lot of empathy. It's best to have empathy, but that's exhausting, right? Because when you feel what they feel, then how do you do your work, right? I okay. worked in human ERs. I mean, they were like, okay, we're done. We're going to the next because they couldn't take that in, right? Yeah. And it's a hard, it's a hard thing to learn. But if if you give if you give someone their feeling, they immediately oh. They understand. They understand where I am, and then there's a there can be a little more of a conversation. So if they could clinically say, "All right, if I they're really angry or they're really upset, and if I give that to them, then maybe they will be able to have a small conversation, and then maybe if there's someone else in in the practice that could come in and sit with them or just be with them because." It's, those are really hard decisions and they're hard emotions when you find out that your animal's dying or is going to die, right? I, 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 think, I think also that it's important for clinicians to give themselves permission to get centered before they enter the room. Yes. To take a few deep breaths, to say to themselves something like, I, I, I'm a person who's devoted to healing, but sometimes... I have to respect the fact that all life ends and mm -hmm. that my job then becomes helping the, my, the, the animal and helping the family member accept a, as smooth a transition as possible. Like to really talk with themselves about the fact that my job isn't to fix this. Yeah. My job no, is not at this them, point. To help them to be with this, this thing that's happening right now and to just sort of quiet themselves as best they can, quiet themselves and come in. But again, give themselves a few moments to take a deep breath, right. to talk to themselves a little bit, to say, this is going to pull at my heartstrings. That's okay. And then to go in and be as open and compassionate as they possibly can be, realizing that this is an end of life situation and it's going to be painful for that person and for them. And I also think one of the issues is the structure of work, that there is just way too much pressure. Yeah. And this is, this is an issue in almost every working environment, certainly in most clinical healthcare environments of all sorts. And it's, it's, it's really an overlay that shouldn't be there. There's so much of a profit motive that yeah, for some, for a corporation. <laughs> yeah, they don't have the time to be human. Yeah. And so it's very important at least to take a few moments and to be kind to yourself before you go into a situation that you know right. is going to be very it's painful very yeah. for the clients. That's, that's, Ken, thank you for that because I, I often tell my new grads that your job is not to fix the problem ever. Your job is to help that client make the best decision for that pet on that day, right? Fine. Because situations change, right? And I think the argument could be made that by not spending that time to get centered and to regulate some of what we're feeling, we actually spend a lot more time later dealing with oh communication yeah. issues right. or dealing with clients that are much more upset than they would be if we had taken the two minutes to do that. And so that's a hard, when you're talking about running a business, that's a hard yeah. argument to make. But um, I I think I, I'm hopeful that the landscape is changing a little bit, um, but that's yeah, really, really helpful advice. It would be so amazing for your teams to be able to put a little effort there when they can and it's hard. Because that will, it will create 
an environment, right? That is not going to deal with so much anger and uh, look, there's always going to be that. The thing I want to also, also talk about is I found this a lot in my internship was there were the, the, the veterinarians, the vet techs said, this dog needs to go, right? This dog needs to go or this cat needs to go. They're sick. And there was one particular man who had a Rottweiler and the Rottweiler had had uh, dialysis. And you know how difficult that is, right? Once a week, you know, there all day. And the vet, the vets were like, I can't, you know, I, know, I what, what is he doing? You know, the thing was, and my buffer with that was, and when I talked to him, this dog was his wife's deceased wife's dog. And he wasn't ready to let go. And so when I went to them, I said, this is really hard for you, but he's not ready. And so, and, and the family was mad. Every, it was, everybody was involved with this case. But he, I mean, to tell him, you need to do this, you know, it, it wasn't going to work, right? And eventually they could not get the tubes in, I think. And he said, I guess it's right. I guess she needs to go. And, and they did. But it's, it's a, I know sometimes there's a lot of frustration. This dog needs to be euthanized. This cat, this cat needs to, you know, but it's a matter of, and when you work with the human side of that, sometimes if one wants the, uh, one of the couple wants the animal to be euthanized, the other doesn't, you know, you're working, you have to work with the two of them to kind of get them to a place, you know, to kind of be okay with one decision as best they can. But, but the veterinarians, <laughs> why aren't they doing this? You know, it's really hard. It's, it's really difficult. I, I'm really happy to hear about the emergence of this field of narrative veterinary medicine, which to me is, it's very much like family systems thinking, <laughs> which is what we're trained in. And, and it is that you have to understand that you're dealing with a human animal ecological system. Yes. And it's very important to understand that it isn't just a disease process. It isn't just the animal and in front of you. It's all the relationships that are bound to this animal and this human being and the history that brings them there. And so you have to, you have to try to get to know something about what, what's going on in that right. whole context. And again, that takes a bit of time and particularly in an emergency setting you've got very it's, little yes, time very little time but yeah. but it is but th that hum that human context relational context is key is absolutely key it really is and the more i sort of like dip my toes into social work the the more i'm able to see that in clinic mm -hmm. um and we talk a lot about like barriers to care, right? If somebody won't, um, if somebody's not coming in to do the blood work that's required to fill a prescription, um, okay, why can they right. not afford it? Can they not get there? Um, right. You know, could they afford the medication if they didn't have to do the blood work, right? Like what is the actual barrier, right? And I think it's really easy for veterinary teams to get angry and frustrated because those are really accessible emotions. Right. Um, but to take that step back and say like, okay, I understand that this is a difficult situation for me and what's coming up for me is anger and frustration, but I wonder why this client isn't right. Ready. Or I wonder going why on for them. Or right. the opposite, right. like I wonder why this client feels like they're ready and I don't think the pet is, right? right. And so to actually ask that question, we talk so much about the human animal bond, but we generally ignore it in clinical medicine. And the clients are the ones that are doing the work of care at home too. And so um, I'm going to transition this into another question because I think that we talk a lot um, about anticipatory grief from the client perspective, but I'm curious about your thoughts in, you know, on anticipatory grief from a veterinary care team perspective, because I think we're also a lot of times in the same boat where, especially in general practice, you, you know, know that you know the animals. We, we know maybe we've been seeing this client once a week, twice a week for sub Q fluids, you know, and we have the added layer of maybe feeling like we're not allowed to grieve for those patients because it's not my dog or it's not my cat. So I'm wondering if you can speak to to how we might 
manage some of that. But, but I'll I'll just say that it's very, it's important to acknowledge one's feelings. Period. Yeah, yeah. it's the, it's, it's okay, it's really and also important. that gives you the the ability to also grieve. Well, yeah, I mean, you've got to if if, if you acknowledge how you're feeling and perhaps even talk it over with one of your coworkers who yeah. knows the situation too, you're probably going to feel somewhat unburdened of that pain of that pain. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things we, I mean, one of the things we know is that the social support is one of the key factors yes. in helping people through grief, through stress. Mm -hmm. And so one of the ways that we do that is we share what we're experiencing and almost immediately there's at least some degree of relief and there's also some degree of change of perspective when we talk it talk about it with another person and i think it'd be perfectly fine for a veterinarian or a veterinary technician to say you know it must be it must be hard for you to do all the work you're doing yeah. with giving the subcutaneous fluids and whatnot. It's, it's, it's hard sometimes for me to think about how much you're going through and how much your right. animal companion is going through. And I, and, and so I, I, I just really appreciate all the care you're giving and, and I'm with you and in, in some of the, the feelings of distress that you have mm -hmm. about what's going on. And of course, you know, this is uh this is ultimately leading towards the end of their lives. And you're, you're doing the best care that you can for them. And uh, we all think that's great. And, but it's a little sad too, because we know that they mean everything to you and they mean a lot to us too. We love seeing them. I mean, just being honest is, is useful. But see what Ken's doing is what everybody can do together. Right. And if the, if the, if a veterinarian, a veterinarian tech set says what, to the client, to the pet parrot, what Ken's saying, it draws everybody together as a, as a team, you know, because they are taking care of their animals at home, right? And so, and you guys are, are and they look to the veterinarians and to the vet techs to help them. The other thing is, are there debriefings? I mean, that's that would be really helpful for the team to take a few minutes and talk about that, especially, I know in ERs, with there were I guess when I went into um, the hospital last week there had been um, I don't know ten euthanasias in a weekend, and that was it was and they were saying it was just brutal. But now do you, how do you how do you deal with that? What do you, do you have an ability to take a few minutes and say we need to talk about this and get it out? Mm -hmm. Because yes, you have to go back to work, but you're still holding on to it. And maybe sometimes there's even some guilt. Could I have done something different with this animal? Could I have changed, you know, a protocol? And that needs to be taken, to be talked about too, you know, because most times it's not. I mean, medicine isn't, isn't exact, right? And things happen. And, and sometimes things are missed, but that's normal. I mean, I, I, I you know, look, it, I think veterinarians as a whole do the best they can do with what they have, with, with the information they have. But a lot of people, then they get, they get backlash, right? From the, uh, because human guardian or pet parents um, not, are not necessarily kind to veterinarians, you know, yeah. Yeah. And, and they can make bad reviews and they can get angry and they can get frustrated. And they're the ones not doing the, the right work, by the way. A lot of times they think they are, but they're not, right? And how do you work with that? You know, the first time I was at my vet, a, a veterinary a veterinary came in and she goes, I got a bad review. And so I debriefed that with her. I said, first of all, you know, she told me the story. It was a, it was a, it was a dog that has seizures, but the, the, the human pet parent didn't want to, didn't want to give her him medication mm -hmm. and then was mad at her. I mean, this is some of the stuff you guys deal with. I'm like, really, oh really hard. I think that having a boundary and keeping to, you know, one of, one of the things I've, and I've mentioned this in other, in other venues is I will sometimes say to myself when I'm dealing with a difficult situation, a difficult group, a difficult family, distance, distance. I'll say in my head, distance, you have to have distance from it. You're not responsible for everything that goes on here and you're not responsible for their reactions 
to the circumstances. And so I think that sometimes we have to have mechanisms for reminding ourselves that there are limits to our responsibility, limits to what we can do to make situations better. And I, 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 I can imagine there are many times where you're met with somebody who isn't following through or doesn't agree, ask your opinion, and then then counters it with their own know-it-all yeah. jargon and you know, all of that kind of stuff. And it's just part of this, I think, is is finding ways every day to soothe yourself. Yeah. You know, when you leave work, how do you when you drive in the car, do you listen to music? Do you listen to some kind of stories on 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 recordings? Do, what when you get home, how do you trans how do you mark the the the, the from being a professional veterinarian to being a person who has a life outside work? You know, many people come home and they'll change clothes or they'll take a shower or whatever. You know, like there there are ritual ways of marking the transitioning the transition to your other life. And but I think that in general, pe people in our society are very, very stressed. And it's important to find, create the time to soothe ourselves, to decompress through whatever means, meditate, whatever works for, for you. And, and one of the things I've often, I actually had to have one of my chickens euthanized yesterday. Oh, you did? And I did, yeah. And, and and the, the, the veterinarians who I take them to are, are just amazing with this. They're all very, very <laughs> soothing and compassionate. And one of the things I've often wondered about for veterinarians is, what is it like to be left with the body of yeah. an animal who you've cared for for a time? And now you have to, I'm assuming you put that body in a plastic bag and put it in the freezer maybe. And what is that, what is that like? To, to have that because I wouldn't want to I wouldn't want to have to do that with somebody who I'd cared for for many years perhaps it's it's interesting that you say that because I I have had the the privilege of being able to euthanize some of my cats at home because uh, I'm yeah. a veterinarian mm -hmm. um and that was something that I encountered um was what to do after because mm -hmm. I was in that situation right and it's something that when when it's not your pet, sometimes you can compartmentalize. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, as right. an as an ER vet, um, that's the only time I interacted with the patient and the the pet owners. And so it was. I don't want to say easier, but it was easier to to just sort of separate that. Mm -hmm. As a general practitioner, it becomes much harder. Yeah. And I found that I personally delegate that task to the technicians, right? Which is maybe not the right thing to do either because they're probably the ones that are interacting with the pet and the and the pet owner even more than I am. But when it was my own pet in my own mm -hmm. house, it was very much like um and I've and I've been with with um pet parents that that very much want to control every aspect of that. Mm -hmm. And that's what they need. So okay, if you want to put them in the um bag, if you want to put them in the um you know, box that you're taking them home and you can, if you feel like you want it, you can do that. You want to do that. You go right ahead. Um, but it's hard. Yeah. And I think it's interesting too, like from a, from a grief perspective that we are always so much in a rush and also avoiding the discomfort. Right. That we just slide right past those moments, but um, to actually create a culture, either, like a, a microculture in a hospital or just within the whole hospital where we normalize having conversations about, you know, wow, you've been giving this dog sub Q fluids twice a week for the last four months. Like, how do you, like, you look forward to seeing this client, you right. know, they mm -hmm. brought you Easter candy, they, whatever. Yeah. And so that that is going to be a loss. So let's talk about how you feel right now and what you're going through as a technician that's also caring for this pet well, as that's, well. That's really important because they become, especially when you know the animal, they become part of your, you're part of the family, right? And that's, and that's really important that that connection is there. And, and I also think that sometimes clinical staff, they, they recoil from talking about the feelings because they fear, well, first of all, they may not be very practiced at that, but they fear mm -hmm. that doing so will open a dam that will be uncontrollable. 
mm-hmm. like Pandora's box. Like yeah. I've seen this in in many different in in, in workplace settings with HR mm-hmm. professionals who have had to do a rough termination. And the the truth of the matter is that that is generally not at all what no. happens. What happens yeah. is there's an unburdening, right. and then there's some relief on the other side of yeah. that. So just to let people know, like, you're not going to lose control entirely if you talk about what it's like to have just gone through this loss experience with your client. Like, just to actually tell them, it's not going to open Pandora's box. It's not going to make make you fall apart entirely Mm -hmm. emotionally. I mean, you may be quite distressed for a tiny bit of time, but you're probably going to feel some relief on the other side. Just to predict that for them can be helpful because then when they experience it, they can say, wow, you know, it actually was useful Mm -hmm. to talk about it, even though I felt like all hell might break loose if I actually do. (laughs) Yeah. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. (laughs) And distress around this stuff is normal, right? Like it would, and that was when I knew I was burned out was when I wasn't feeling distressed anymore. Uh Very good. That's right. Anything. Right. Oh yeah. Because it's right. Well, if you don't, if you don't acknowledge, if you don't acknowledge what's going on in, in, in your, inside yourself emotionally, it tends to come out one way or another. Right. It comes out in whatever kinds of stress symptoms you might have, headaches, stomach aches, back aches, joint, irritability, snappiness toward other people, you know, all drinking too much (laughs) problems, drink, you know, negative coping strategies, drinking or whatever you may do that that is a compulsive behavior those, those kinds and so you know we're, we're, people are are fairly predictable there are things we can do that help ourselves and if we don't do them we tend to have difficulties in one way or another and you know some i once asked a, a guy who did who had to manage downsizing an hr leader i said how do you deal with this because i i been with him through a few of them. And he said, how do I deal with it? Two triple bypasses. That's how I deal with it. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, well, that's, that's not a good thing. That's one answer. Yeah. <laughs> but, th- but the other thing is we don't grieve well in our country anyway. No, period. In our society. We just We're don't. We're not socialized we don't, to accept. We don't, want, we don't want to do it. We're, right? not, we're not socialized to accept sadness. Yeah. It's like everybody's supposed to be happy, happy, happy all the time. <laughs> and I will say this, grief work, doing grief work is about the hardest thing you could ever do because you can't make it better. You yeah. can't take it away. Yeah. You got to be in it. You can only be present with it. Yeah. And and with the person who's going through it or, or just acknowledging your own loss and your mm-hmm. own grief. So. I think that's such a fantastic way to wrap this up is to say that there is nothing that we can do mm-hmm. as a veterinary care team that is going to fix that, no. right? There's nothing that we can do that will make that client, that pet parent hurt less in this moment. No. But what we can do is be available to sit yeah. with them, to acknowledge our own feelings and to sometimes share them. And yep. acknowledge theirs, yep. right? And work. Yep. 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 That true. sounds good. Well, Caitlin, it's very nice talking. Very to you. nice to meet you. Yeah. Too. Thank you so much. Thank you.